Hello, everyone. I'm Kimberly Guilfoyle, along with Geraldo Rivera, Jesse Waters, Dana Perino, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. <laughs> Tonight, President Trump fighting back against Steve Bannon, saying his former chief White House strategist has, quote, lost his mind. It all comes ahead of the release of a new book in which Bannon is reportedly quoted calling the 2016 Trump Tower Russia meeting treasonous, among other slights. This afternoon, Mr. Trump discrediting his former advisor in a lengthy statement, quote, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Steve had very little to do with our historic victory. Doesn't represent my base. He's only in it for himself. Steve was rarely in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me and only pretends to have had influence to fool a few people with no access and no clue whom he helped write phony books. The White House is unfazed by the latest developments. Sarah Sanders says this has no effect on the president, his agenda, and his base. I don't think it does anything to the president's base. The, the, the base and the people that supported this president supported the president and supported his agenda. Those things haven't changed. The president's still exactly who he was uh, yesterday as he was two years ago when he started out on the campaign trail. His agenda hasn't changed, and he's continuing to fight for and push for that agenda. And I think the base is extremely excited and happy with the job that this president has done in his first year in office. Look at all he's accomplished. I think they're pretty happy with where he is. Okay, so uh, disruptive today to say the least, but you know, this coming out kind of a bombshell because the recent reports have been that Steve Bannon was still in, you know, good accord with the White House, that he was in communication with the president, but it seems like this was a direct shot at the president's son, at Don Jr. In this book, and you see the president responding like rapid fire. Yeah, this is like one of those, we all been there, those summer flings. <laughs> an intense affair, and then it just turns to boiling bunnies. Once it's over, ev everything just gets ugly. You know, I read that excerpt, and I have to say, you know, it's, I don't know how much this actually matters, because my take home from all of this is nobody there expected this to happen. And, and, and they didn't change who they were. None of these people changed. By this, you mean him getting elected? It, yes. And, they, and so they didn't change who they were. They're the same people. They're not politicians, you know, and they're kind of feeling their way. And I'm reading this stuff, and I'm going, it's still better than Hillary. You have a choice. A businessman who did this as a lark. He did this as a lark. Or someone who felt entitled to the job and felt that she didn't have to do much of anything and that she deserved it. And then there's a guy who kind of just waltzed in, surrounded himself with some interesting characters, some that maybe he regrets. But I think we can, en we can enjoy all this delicious gossip. But ultimately, this is a hell of an experiment. This is a hell of an experiment. A non-politician who won and surprised everybody, including apparently himself and his family, and is now doing a damn decent job. I mean, I'm sorry, but we've gone through some of these accomplishments. Yesterday, in fact. And yesterday, let's roll that tape. You're <laughs> not kidding. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, he's actually doing better than most politicians could ever hope for. That's kind of interesting. It's an experiment that we're all living through at once. It's kind of, it's unique. It's phenomenal. Okay, so you're, in your expectation, he exceeded all expectations that people Look, really I was. I, I would say at Fox News, I was in the top four critics of Trump. And I, it's because I didn't know what to expect That's from him. That's relative. Yeah, it is relative. <laughs> a lot of them are gone now, so maybe I'm, I don't know. Yeah. But, anyway. you, but may you know be, what? But, you may be not stuffed out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, anyway, <laughs> my, but the, my point is, it's, it, given what we Just know me. about back then and what we're seeing now, it's who cares about that? Okay. What Dana, what's your take on it with the communication Well, I took it from a, just a different perspective of dealing with books in Washington, especially when you work for a, a, a sitting president. Um, if you think about George Stephanopoulos, when his book came out during the Clinton administration, it was a really big deal. And he was basically cut off from them for a really long time with um, advisors like James Carville and Paul Begala basically saying, you are dead to us. Um, Scott McClellan, during the Bush administration, wrote the book that I was the press secretary at the time. Right. Scott had hired me. I was super upset about it because I knew Washington loves a story. Americans, like, you dig into it. And one of the things President Bush called me into the Oval Office and said was, I hear you're upset about this book, but I don't want you to worry about it. 
And I said, well, can I throw him under the bus first? And he uh -huh. said, no, I want you to try to forgive him. And he said, believe me, no one's going to think about this in three weeks. That could be true here, except for two things. Yeah. One, I think that is positive for Republicans in the long term, and one thing that could be tr trouble ahead. One is that the severing of ties between President Trump and Steve Bannon for good is actually probably good for continued cooperation for the types of accomplishments that Greg was alluding to, especially on the legislative side of things. Because if you don't have the constant pushing against Mitch McConnell and Paul yeah. Ryan from Bannon, then you actually allow them to work together and be able to accomplish things. And you probably don't have to worry about Steve Bannon trying to primary all of those incumbent senators that he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. The thing I think that was eye-opening about the uh, excerpt that Greg's referring to that Michael Wolff writes about is that in one of the quotes, Steve Bannon talks about that the issue real here really isn't anything that had to do in 2016. It was before 2016, and it's about money laundering. And he talks specifically about Jared Kushner. Mm. And that, to me, was the one where I was like, I'd pay attention to that if I were them. In the president's statement, he doesn't address any of the claims. He does call him a staffer, which is a real <laughs> burn. Uh, and I remember... Um, Matt Lauer asked President Bush when his book came out, you know, why didn't you write about Scott McClellan in your book? And President Bush said, because I didn't think it was relevant. Mm. And the, that's the way that you try to sort of push these things mm -hmm. out of the spotlight. I, I, this will be a story for a couple of days and then it'll probably move on. But that piece that I talked about, the money laundering one, was eye opening. Okay, Jesse, I think it's interesting because the president went out of his way to make these statements as like he has past knowledge, information, experience, where he had uh, problems with Bannon, et cetera, and believed some of these things to be occurring in the past when he was there, right? But I know that they still were in communication once Steve Bannon left the White True. House. Yeah, I'm surprised he didn't say, I didn't even know Steve Bannon. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, the story is either fake news or if it's real, but either way it helps the president because if it's fake, the media shot itself in the foot. And if it's real, then Bannon's weakened and there's going to be no more Roy Moores. I read the first couple paragraphs. There's three big lies. Trump didn't want to win. Melania cried when Trump went, and Kellyanne Conway didn't think they were going to win. I know those are all lies. And then you have Bannon saying that this whole meeting at Trump Tower was treasonous. Mm -hmm. And then in 60 Minutes, two months ago, he said the collusion thing was a farce. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to think. This guy, Wolf, has a terrible reputation in his own industry. Uh, people say he's a gun for hire. Uh, there is a uh, complaint that I think the last book, 12 people came forward and said, all of the quotes attributed to me were completely manufactured. Well, he talks to quite a few people. Yeah, he talks to a lot of people, but he's got a reputation for inventing things out of thin air. With that said, if this stuff is true, and Steve Bannon said the President of the United States' son is a traitor and is weak and could crack, and his son-in-law is sleazy, then not only is that incredibly disloyal, it's stupid. And Trump values loyalty almost above being everything. Being a team player. Be being a team player. Yeah. And this was something the Mooch actually previewed when he said what he said, uh, supposedly off the record. And so if this is true, he has no credibility now going into the primaries, which I think is going to be good because no one's going to want to give him money. So that could actually help the right. president. He doesn't have to deal with any of that primary stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I take it at a very personal level. I think that Dana, in terms of the legislative prospects, very astutely and professionally laid out the impact. I think it will be a positive impact, the fact that Bannon is now in exile. But et tu brute, you talk about treason. Who, who is the traitor here? Yep. Steve Bannon is the traitor, the scum. How dare he? How dare he? I mean, what he did to Donald Trump Jr., I mean, that, that, that's one thing. I, I think that the best defense... Uh, for Donald Trump Jr. in that infamous meeting at the White House, uh, not being nefarious, is that he was so naive, there was no lawyer there, sure. so inexperienced, he was so over-eager, over-enthusiastic. To me, that's his best defense for Do Donald Jr., that he didn't intend uh, to, uh, to collude with Russians uh, in any way that was illegal anyway. He wanted to get whatever information he could get. Uh, who wouldn't take that meeting he was thinking in those days? Do you believe he, he said new? these things? I, I, I think, but... To me, the worst thing mm -hmm. that Steve Bannon did in this whole episode is to suggest very strongly that Donald Trump Jr. is sitting in that Trump Tower a couple of blocks from here, surrounded by these, these commies, and then after the meeting, uh, Steve Bannon Jr. says there is zero possibility he didn't take these Russians upstairs to meet his father. Mm. The Washington Post, the New York Times, 
every investigative reporter in this nation has been striving to connect Donald there. Trump yeah. with that meeting with the Russians and has failed to do so. So now here is Steve Bannon suggesting you could take it to the bank. Zero possibility it did not happen. To me, that is the, and this is the guy who was his best friend for at least those few months. Well, and chief that strategist really and uh, coming on board. So yeah, that's why when Jesse, when you mentioned that, saying that it's disconcerting because somebody was supposed to be on the same team, uh, you know, with the president, very loyal. Um, advising him, trying to transform, you know, American politics and the forgotten men and women across the country. Uh, you don't do it by making these kind of very strong statements and, and taking a swipe and trying to uh, take out the president's son and the family and essentially the president himself. And he's given the left and the media a weapon to then hurt the president with because a lot of these same people have said for a whole year that Steve Bannon's this horrible person, he's this racist, he's this propagandist, and now they're taking him for what he said and using, now all of a sudden he's a truth teller, mm -hmm. and they're using this against the president to hurt them, and, you know, it's just sad. The whole thing's sad, yeah, and it didn't need to happen. What, one quick point. Greg suggests that President Trump did this on a lark. I've known him a long time. He started telling me he was going to be president of the United States in 1998, 1999, 2000. He was going to run as a Reform yes. Party candidate. Do you have that on uh, tape? He wanted to be president <laughs> more than he wanted to make money. Okay. Yeah, but I think, I mean, I believe that he had doubts the way everybody had doubts when, when and to, to, no, towards the end. So I buy into the idea that everybody was surprised. As for Bannon, I believe he hated the family because the family provided insulation from Bannon. Those were the only people that were in his way because I think Bannon saw Trump as a vessel for his own disruptive principles and, and agenda. He wanted to disrupt. He, Bannon. Well, because he didn't is, like the other the globalist tendencies. Yeah, but he was also, the well, well, no, Bannon is a radical. He's a radical. He wants to disrupt. He doesn't have mild opinions. Every opinion is the extreme opinion. So, you know, look, Ivanka despised, would despise somebody like Roy Moore. Who embraced Roy Moore, Bannon? Mm -hmm. So that's the difference, and that's what you're seeing. And she could run circles around him intellectually. So mm -hmm. please. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to see where this goes from here. Let's see. Check your uh, Twitter accounts ahead. <laughs> that nuclear tweet from President Trump, his fake news award tease, and much more when the five returns. Stay with us. Kim Jong-un threatens to nuke America. Our president responds with a threat of his own and critics explode. You may have seen the tweet, Mr. Trump, warning, I too have a nuclear button, but it is much bigger and more powerful one than his, <laughs> and my button works. It caused another eruption from the president's critics. Watch. You know, funny. He is not merely being cavalier with a threat about nuclear war. He's being cavalier in a way that makes him seem demented and deranged. This is... Um, language that would have been rejected from the script of Dr. Strangelove. We can't begin to normalize this. This is dangerous, this is childish, this is unpresidential, it's not befitting the leader of the free world. Perhaps never have we seen a man whose profound uh, sexual and masculine insecurities are literally threatening to annihilate the planet. None of this normal, none of this acceptable, none of this frankly stable behavior. It even continued at the White House press briefing this afternoon. After the tweet about, the, about nuclear uh, threats, the nuclear button tweet, should Americans be concerned about the president's mental fitness that he appears to be speaking so lightly about threats regarding the nuclear button? I think the president uh, and the people of this country should be concerned about the mental fitness of the leader of North Korea. He's made repeated threats. Uh, he's tested missiles uh, time and time again for years. And this is a president who's not going to cower down and is not going to be weak and is going to make sure that he does what he's promised to do, and that's stand up and protect the American people. So last night I was there, I was there by myself, and Peter got went out with the guys, and I don't know how to use the four remotes that it takes to watch television, uh -oh. so I was just <laughs> watching on Twitter, and I was wholly entertained watching all of this reaction, including one where, um, well, I guess we have this. Take a look at what happened.
In fact, I've asked uh, Twitter spokesman, does this violate Twitter's terms of service, uh, making this kind of threat toward North Korea? Uh, so far, no immediate comment from the company, still waiting to hear. I think they're trying to decide if this kind of tweet, referring to a nuclear button that he knows how to use and it works, whether that actually is a violation mm. of the terms of service because it may threaten violence. Greg? It's so nuts, right? Is, he is officially America's hall monitor. He is actually, he is actually a walking oh nuclear button. Oh he is God. round and shiny like a button, and you push him, and all of a sudden he goes off. Oh, my God, he's violated terms of service. Oh, my God. Oh, that's what TOS stands yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah. anyway, this is, Stelter it. said that, you know, if, if Trump were a foreign leader, we'd be worried. I say hooray. Yeah. You know, for once, the, we're the world's concern, not the reverse. By the way, irrationality by other countries worked for them. We put up with it because we didn't know, because we didn't know what would happen next. So this actually is a good thing. And, and the best part about it is it's working. North Korea and South Korea are opening channels to talk. Why? Because North Korea is feeling the pressure. We're actually at war with North Korea by stopping ships, by, through these embargoes, through these sanctions. The war's already started. They're feeling it. They want to talk to South Korea, which means they want to talk to us. But one more point, and I, I got to talk about this. Where's my notes? Oh, grab your notes, beautiful. Grab, okay, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did, did you see that Kim Jong Un is getting a makeover? No. He's getting a makeover, and it's because what do, why do men get makeover, uh, makeovers? Why do they clean up their act? For because women? they're no, they're seeking a new relationship. Okay. He's seeking oh, a new relationship. Oh, oh. He realizes that Sweet. he's got to like, oh, you know what? Kim. It's time. P people are too ap apocalyptic about this. Things are working out. This is great news. Oh, my there, there God. There are many different audiences, Kimberly, whenever yes. a president speaks. So you talk to your allies, your enemies, uh, the American people, the military. And so this tweet might have been meant specifically for Kim Jong Un to see, I would guess. Oh, of but course. It, uh, there, uh, there are repercussions where you have. People who aren't in his base are get worried about it. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if they did a lot of reassuring today. No, but I kind of <laughs> like this because it's obviously thrown Kim Jong Un over the edge, and now he's getting a mommy makeover, a little lift, <laughs> and a tuck. And I think it's hilarious because he's feeling insecure about himself because President Trump is unnerving him. He doesn't like it. Psychologically, he's not responding well to it. I mean, I don't have a problem with, uh, you know, President uh, Trump's tweet. I think it's fantastic. I'm glad that somebody's standing up to this guy. This guy has been like an international punk and bully forever, and he wants to threaten everybody with his nukes. And it's about time that somebody stood up to him and said, enough is enough. Because you know what? He's been catered to. He's been allowed to exist and proliferate with this nuclear uh, power ability. And quite frankly, it makes the world world less safe. So if President Trump wants to be the person that's going to stand up and do something about it, you know, along with Nikki Haley and motivating the U.N. to do the right thing, uh, fine by me. Talk about bigger button, better working, whatever, all day long. How do you see it, Geraldo? Well, I see it uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, first, there's no doubt that Trump's button is bigger. So it's true. <laughs> because you were on The Apprentice. And <laughs> <laughs> because I, I know what our nuclear arsenal is like. Secondly, he's not stupid. He's not reckless. He understands Article One, the War Powers Act. He knows, you know, that there's a, a, a rigid process to go through before you declare war. What I urge people, and I continually go back to this, particularly with so many of my friends being in, uh, hostile to the president, it's not what he says it's what he does that really matters. You have to, he, he can talk an inflammatory game, the president can. But in terms of his policies and in terms of his actions, he's really a, a pretty prudent, traditional and, and effective, uh, going back to what Greg said to start the show, president, a moderate Republican president, I think that he's doing a, a fine job. And the fact that he shakes up this guy, the rocket man and so forth, <laughs> I think there's nothing wrong with that. I was, I was in Korea when they first opened up the dialogue between South and North, mm -hmm. and they, they had telethons where you had r relatives of the North Koreans talking to their cousins in South Korea. Everyone thought there'd be rapprochement, that it would be good. It went nowhere, it, it got all polluted, and now he has a nuclear also. I don't think there's anything wrong with en encouraging Korea to Diplomacy. cool things down amongst right. themselves. All right, Jesse, take it away. Whatever you want. I Let's... don't think Lil Rocket Man needs a makeover at all. Why mess with perfection? He's got the high fade, <laughs> he's got the tailored tan jacket. He looks good Similar, to me. similar. When I read the tweet, I just laughed. I think Trump aims to entertain, but he's also aiming to ridicule, just like he did during the election. Lil Marco, Lion Ted, Crooked Hillary. He's an expert brander, and he humiliated Lil Rocket Man in front with of all of his button. Asian friends with his little. <laughs>
control button and for the media to question Trump's mental stability. They like worshiped Obama like a cult leader for eight years. They're the ones that are mentally unstable. And also, they need to accept Trump's style. He's done this for almost two years. Stop trying to diagnose him. But this is the reaction to when you have President Obama. You usually get the opposite of mm -hmm. the president. He was, you know, thoughtful and professorial, and he led from behind. He never confronted evil. Trump comes out there. He's a street fighter, brawler, very bellicose, and he shoots from the hip. And I think that's what the American people wanted. And when you look back at the results, what did Obama's soft action do? It led this guy to nuke up. Trump's just trying to clean his mess up. I say, what's more dangerous? You know, you know what uh, tr no, Trump should tweet next? I love big buttons. I cannot <laughs> lie. That is... Uh, sir, mix a lot. My yes. God. I hope you heard that, sir. Okay. A monologue you won't hear anywhere else on the president's upcoming fake news awards ceremony. It. Up next. So Donald Trump just announced he's giving out the most dishonest and corrupt media awards to its biggest offenders. This is a first, but are you surprised? Have you noticed the media is an object of criticism for the president? So what does that cause? Well, the media seems as robust as ever. Everyone's either a Woodward or a Bernstein when they aren't high. <laughs> Similarly, <laughs> homicides, homicides in Chicago have fallen 60% in 2017, a welcome reduction from the bloodshed that, again, made its mayor a target of Trump's ire. So do you see my point? Why didn't this reduction occur under Obama? And why wasn't the media more aggressive during the same time? The aggressive journalism and aggressive police, policing are actually resets, due in part to what I call the PTW effect. Prove Trump wrong effect. For years, Fox News railed against media bias. Did the media care? Not really. For the last few years, we've covered Chicago's problems. Did Rahm Emanuel listen? At all? No, he slammed Chick-fil-A instead. <laughs> Yet now we're seeing the media adjust its behavior over accusations of fake news. <clears throat> and now a city mayor, under a president who isn't his best friend, put more cops on the street. My theory? Bureaucrats and media hate Trump so much that they can't let him win the argument. So they up their game just to shut the guy up. So laugh at Trump's tweets about Chicago or Iran, the media, or whoever he chooses to target. It may be the best motivational tool we got. <laughs> Geraldo, you, do you, don't you think the media is now extra motivated because every time they screw up, they got it. They got to listen to Trump make fun of them. <laughs> well, I think that they're. I'm, I'm old enough to have lived through and been in the business during President Nixon, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, he could not buy a break. Mm -hmm. President Trump, I think, gets even worse press than President Nixon did. I, yeah. I think that every, absolutely everything he does is construed in the most evil, negative way possible. Uh, and, it, and these awards that are coming out next week, next Monday, it's a gimmick. It's a, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a shtick. But on the other hand, I was in Puerto Rico with the president when Paul Krugman, the Nobel-winning economist of the New York Times, wrote the story of how President Trump's neglect of Puerto Rico led to a cholera mm, epidemic yeah. in Puerto Rico. There was no cholera epidemic in Puerto Rico. Are you nominating Rico. Krugman? I nominate Paul Krugman. Krugman. I nominate him, the Nobel uh, laureate uh, ec economist for the uh, whatever <laughs> he's going to call these raspberries. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's on intellectual welfare. They let him say whatever he wants, and he's always wrong, Kimberly. Do you have any nominations? What do you make of these awards? Yeah, I think this is going to be very funny. They're going to have to put everybody on CNN, like Don Lemon and Jake Tapper, and everybody on, like, five-second <laughs> delay, because they're going to be, like, losing it, freaking out, because they're going to try and defend themselves, say, no, 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 we're against these awards. We're actually very fair. We're honest. What is President Trump saying? So I'm sure they're actually quite nervous about it. And I like that he's taking, you know, he's taking control of the situation. He's behind the wheel saying, I'm going to tell you what I think about you. I'm going to say it straight to your face. Uh, and that's it. I'm going to tell the whole world. I, I like the approach. He's using it, I think, effectively, diplomatically, uh, the international stage, as relates to national security, whether it's immigration, it's taxes, it's his approach. It worked for him during the campaign, so he's doing it still. You don't think it threatens the First Amendment? 
No, I think the First Amendment is solid. Last time I checked yeah, with the think, U.S. Supreme I, Court, I, I think it'll be fine. You know what it is? You know what it is, Dana? It's something you would do on a show. Like every, like we put it, like, what, what are your predictions for 2018 or winners and losers? This is a guy born and bred watching Fox News. It was my, the first thing I thought when I saw it last night is that the five is gonna have the best ratings on Monday because yes. it's Monday at five. Yes. Um, I, I think it's good if it's done with a laugh, which I, I think, think it, it would purpose. be, right? So, like, if it's yeah. a let's hold you up for ridicule uh, yeah. in, the, in, in the media, I don't think that's necessarily good. Krugman's obviously a good example. And I think if the tone and tenor of it is right, I think it could actually be kind of a joke and maybe even fun for everybody. Yeah. I do think there is something to be said about how other countries see it and how other countries use it against their own people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not good. Really? Do you really? I, I've heard you that argument, and I, I understand, and, and you know, I, I read Absolutely. the editorials that always say that. But I travel a lot, and I, I, no one ever comes up to me and says, See, uh, you have fake news in America. We, you know, it, I just, what do I they come up? It. What do they say? Yeah. Yeah. Say, hey, buddy, you want to buy some? <laughs> oh my God! I thought you were gonna say selfie. But That's I, what I thought too. I remember when your selfie was stalking oh, that, uh, me on Instagram. Jesse? No, I'd say we're watching the Trump presidency, but as you said, we're watching the Trump show, uh -huh. and the show's on at five, so we're gonna get a great number. I think it was on purpose. Yes, and yes, he's he loves the five. like you said in the monologue, the media into being more fair and balanced. Mm -hmm. Either that, or he's just bringing them as, you know, phony but, losers. Yeah, but also like Rahm Emanuel. Now he's doing this. He didn't do this under Obama. Why? That's so weird to me. It was, he's, I mean, it's just interesting but to I, me. I don't think the media has enough self-awareness to yeah. course correct. Right. Because I think they're so blinded by the Trump hatred that they don't recognize his comedy chops. Yeah. If I were the CNN people getting all these awards, <laughs> I would just say I'd make fun of his hair. I'd say focus on North Korea. I'd laugh about it. Yeah. But they yes. think... They're this is humorless. like a press genocide. Right. And they're all victims, and the First Amendment's under attack. Five seconds and they delay. take themselves way too seriously. All right. Team it. Clinton still losing it over that Vanity Fair knitting video. I missed that. Why well, they're taking it out on Mitt next. Working on your sequel to your book, What Happened? What the hell happened? Take more photos in the woods. Take up a new hobby in the new year. Volunteer work. Knitting, improv comedy, literally anything that'll keep you from running again. That Vanity Fair video wasn't received well by the left. Some accusing the magazine of sexism over its suggestion, Hillary Clinton, go away and take up a hobby like knitting. Hillary's team apparently still hasn't let it go. Now setting a double standard for another failed presidential candidate who could run for office again. Mitt Romney. Former campaign spokesman Brian Fallon tweets, Mitt Romney may run for Senate? I thought failed presidential candidates were only allowed to take up knitting. Another campaign alum, Nick Morrow, writes, strange how losing male presidential candidate Mitt Romney is being immediately oh, discussed as a replacement for Orrin so Hatch's stupid. Senate seat and isn't being told to take up knitting. Mm. There is a different stand between Romney and Hillary. Uh. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Also, I just don't understand. Why, can't, why not just laugh along with it? They or, can't. Or, like, Absolutely. why make it an issue, g give things attention? They're prolonging it. Yeah. Not a good idea. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the Clinton team can't accept the fact that... Well, does Greg, she want to run for Senate? That, no, and she doesn't. I mean, come on. And, and she doesn't, yeah. She's never... Well, maybe mayor. I think that was the only thing. But why can't they understand that maybe people don't mayor. like her because she's not likable, not because Over she's a Blasio, woman? Yeah. Take, mitt, you knit. <laughs> That's what I say. What is, by the way, what is wrong with knitting? Like it's a. It's actually a good hobby. It's very insulting to the millions of people who knit uh, to make sweaters for people, and a lot of oh men God. knit. I think Rosie Greer. And I, I mean, think you do, don't away, you? Uh, was a was a knitter. So this is, the point is, the Republicans are lucky to have Mitt Romney. The Democrats are not lucky to have Hillary. He's an asset. She's a. Oh. Al Albatross. Okay. Well, and, so. and also, I love it when the left eats itself. You know, Vanity Fair is very liberal. All those jokes were very old and had been used elsewhere. By Greg but here. But yeah, but they were turned, who's attacking them? Other liberals. So when, they, when you see that happening, it just brings joy to my face. That's a good point, because when there's a lot of uh, magazines on the right that go after Republicans, that's considered healthy debate, but you're not allowed to criticize they a apologized. Democrat. They apologized. 
They, they, yeah, they apologized. They apologized. Yeah. What is that about? I, I just think that sexism is now being used the way racism was for intellectually lazy people. When you don't have a real issue, you go to the uh, to the go-to. Typical sexist. And and I don't think <laughs> Hillary Clinton could win as a, in the running for the senator or mayor. I think that she is such a terrible candidate. And God bless her, she's a wonderful woman. Uh, you know, she did a you know a great job when she was in the Senate, and I I, I like her a lot. But she ran a lousy campaign. Uh, she would, you know, Mitt Romney, on the other hand, ran a pretty good campaign up against the really very popular president who had a wonderful line, uh, you know, uh, bin Laden dead, GM alive, and uh, Barack Obama. And I, I think that Mitt Romney can, he has the juice to serve the country. He got 70% of the vote in Utah where he'd be running for Senate. He's, he's from there, essentially, his roots there so deep. I think he'd be great in the Senate. Well, I would rather see Hillary as mayor of New York than Bill de Blasio. I agree. Really God, he's the worst. <laughs> oh, my God, don't ruin my mojo. Um, yeah, so in terms of Hillary Clinton, she hasn't ever, like, increasingly shrinkage situation with her supporters. So the last few diehards are in there. Anytime anybody says anything that they believe to be a slight or malign her in the slightest, they freak out and go on super attack. I agree with Dana. They should just take it in stride a little bit and just go, okay, fine. And Mitt Romney, by the way, he may have lost presidential election, but he's a winner. I mean, you know, this is somebody that actually I believe honestly can serve Utah very well. And this is somebody who didn't go around and cry like a baby after and write what happened and do a whole big, you know, book like blaming everybody for everything when she just didn't campaign that hard and it wasn't about Trump. It was like she was not a very good candidate. You know, he worked 10 times harder than she did. Everybody knows it. Her staff knows it. President Obama knows it. They put themselves out on the line for her and she disappointed a lot of people that worked very hard and gave a lot of money to support her. So the Democrats know that they better pick somebody else if they have any chance going forward. Mitt Romney, I don't think there's no comparison between the two. Yeah, and he's probably going to win that Senate seat, wouldn't you imagine? If, Piece if of he, cake, if right? If he runs, yeah. Yeah. Wins. Piece of cake. And Who would you run it? against, Stephen? Doesn't matter. I can yeah, hear I the, I hear the, uh, of, uh, the feminist defense for this. No more men. Remember, though, that the left also, they, yeah. they loved Mitt Romney when he was uh, attacking President Trump, you know, during the campaign. Uh, they will, uh, they, they'll turn around, uh, so turn true. against him soon. They, All right. true. Another Trump bashing rant at The View goes off the rails. Up next. <laughs> How many times have we said that? <laughs> As The View goes off the rails. What happened? Yeah, baby. <laughs> so welcome back, everybody. As you know, the Trump presidency has taken a toll on most of the hosts over at The View. My old pal, Joy Behar, for example, she kicked off the new year with another, some call it unhinged tirade, this time comparing President Trump to Iran's supreme leader. And The View went south from there. It's not apples and apples. It's not equal. Mm -hmm. But we're on a very slippery slope, slope in this country toward throwing democracy out the window but every the single day. We have to defend the freedom of the press and civil rights here. Mm -hmm. We do, but and, we're not being you know, stoned in the street for being gay. Not yet. Not yet. They're completely, not yet. They're, not yet. They're, Thank goodness for Meghan McCain. I, she really is a, a wonderful, sober voice, a realistic voice. I love Anna Navarro, one of my best friends, one of the smartest people in, uh, in TV. Joy Behar is very, very funny, very engaging. But when you start comparing what they're doing in a country that is repressive, <laughs> like Iran, with what are you laughing at? The, Anna Navarro is one of the smartest people <laughs> she in is. TV. Every week we have an Anna Navarro soundbite sounding because insane. She, her problem is she's one of these people who went down the hate Trump road. And once you go back. down that road, you can't come back. You, once, and I see the same like thing with stand. Dave Tapper and the CNN people. Once you go, once you go there, once you see this guy is he's uh, he's uh, you know a radical. Once crazy you go hack, you never go back. You never. You really you can't you can't get. <laughs> so I think, Kimberly, what? I believe <laughs> that the view. You okay? You're yeah. Right. No. Like, <laughs> you're all together. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it, it is. It's like the Rosie O'Donnell school of. Uh, entertainment. Sure. It's, it's not, they don't, I, they don't mean it, I don't think. Well, look, I mean, mean I, personally, I like Joy Behar a lot. I think she's very sweet. She's a lot of fun. She's uh, great to, to have at a dinner table, that's for sure. Um, this is the nature of their show. They get after it. Well, it's true. She's not, if you sit next to her, she's funny. I love how every, we're, we're pre, every statement we're about to say, we go, oh, they're a really nice person. They're we're, really great. Because we want to sell a book on The View one day. <laughs> Just say that that was an idiotic comment. I, well, I'm that sorry. would be during your turn to speak. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> 
Indeed. Right. Okay, so the point is, this is what they do. They have fun, they mix it up, and that's what part of the show is. They're not like a hardcore, you know, news show. Okay. They give opinions, and these are the opinions that she has had from the beginning about okay. President Trump. Do you believe that Joy Behar believes that uh, because of Trump's policies, the United States is sliding into an Iran-like government? Do you, think, <laughs> do you think that Joy really believes that? I would say there's a 50% chance that she <laughs> believes that. I don't believe it. I believe Meghan McCain scored a point, and instead of admitting she got it wrong, she tried to, like, weasel out of it and say, maybe, maybe she got burned in a debate. You know what that's like. Geraldo, I saw you on The Factor. Sometimes you just spew when you don't have any defense. Oh, my God. And that's what happened to her. She said, maybe, maybe, maybe. And if a Republican on Fox News under Obama had said, President Obama... Could soon, we could start seeing Christians murdered in the streets. That would be a huge national story. And, and I don't power. know whether or not the right. media covers for The View or they don't have any, you know, they don't think Joy Behar is this titan of journalism, so they let it slide. Do you think well, they take it seriously? Yeah, I don't think they do. And Dana, do you think that it is a rhetorical flourish or do you believe that they truly believe that the country is no, heading down to I, I, I hell in a handbag? It's, it's rhetorical flourish, but I do think that there are people who think that they're really worried and they wake up worried and they stay worried and they stay in an agitated state. But actually, the Things are good. I mean, Things are good. We're talking about the economy is good. And also, um, if, if there's concerns about, um, for example, they're talking about gay people. Like, if you want to, if you want to help gay people, changing the regime in Iran would go a long way yeah. to helping gay and people. And helping women. Yeah. You know. I, mean, um, I don't understand. They should the, be for it. I think she forgot that Donald Trump was for gay marriage before yeah. Obama was. Oh. Cool. Yeah. Um, but the other thing too is, I agree I, with with Geraldo. This is more about cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. and and confirmation bias. You, when you're asking, does she really believe it? She doesn't believe it, but she can't allow herself to admit it because of the confirmation bias. She cannot admit that all of that emotional input that she's held for so long could be wrong. And this happens to everybody. If you hated Obama for eight years, and then you find, and you look back and you find out maybe there were a few things that he did bad, can you actually do well? Can you admit that because you've held on to this? So what she's, what she's yeah, it's the confirmation can't. bias. Like to Anna Navarro, she, I, you know, I, she is smart, but her confirmation bias and the cognitive dissonance has turned her into a one-note wonder. She go, can't stop. Once you play that, exactly. One more thing is next. <laughs>in my mind. Uh, indeed you are. It's time now for one more thing. Greg. Oh, do I have a podcast for you tonight? It's with, if you were a fan of Red Eye or just a fan of Lauren Savon, she's on my podcast. You go to foxnews.com slash podcasts and we talk about her experience with Harvey Weinstein, among other things. And I got to tell you, it's a humdinger. You're going to like it. Uh, uh, so go tune that in. <laughs> That's my thing. Go ahead. Yeah. Done. All right, didn't you have the knitting addendum? <laughs> oh, yes. Rosie Greer is alive and well, and he knits as well as Ryan Scott Reynolds, Leo, Scott Bale, the needlepoint. Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, yes. yes there are a lot, of, a lot of knitters. It's okay to knit or needlepoint. And you make the special <laughs> socks for? Yes. Dobbs. Uh, Lou Dobbs. I, I, yes. I, I knitted Lou Dobbs a bodysuit that he wears oh, in oh, the winter. Oh, Dana? Nice. Oh. I, I think it's Jesse next. It's tough oh. to follow. But Dana Jesse? will like this one. Okay. You were on Jeopardy at one point, yeah, right? I was. All right, well, there was an unfortunate Terribly, spelling gaffe in Jeopardy. Let's listen. A song by Coolio from Dangerous Minds goes back in time to become a 1667 John Milton classic. Nick. What is Gangster's Paradise Lost? Yes. Our judges have reevaluated one of your responses a few moments ago, Nick. You said gangsters instead of gangstas on that song by Coolio. So we take 3,200 away from you, so you are now in second place. Ooh. That is so He ended up winning, but it's like... That's it's so just a white guy. No, yeah. that's, that's like L-I-L, not That's like a little. pronunciation. So that is right. so He didn't bogus. want to, like, culturally appropriate. That is that's so... Right. He played it safe. Give the money back. It's that is so lame. Someone it's wrote in and complained about it. God, what haters. Really? Boycotting Jeopardy.
Am I next? I'm next. Okay. Yeah, you, you, Dana. So, Mike Ritlin, check this out. He rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange today on behalf of Warrior Dog. Ritlin was a Navy SEAL for 12 years and started the Warrior Dog Foundation in 2013. Um, basically, what he does is he started this foundation to care for retired military and law enforcement canines. And he opened a ranch in Cooper, Texas, where these canines can live out their retirement with dignity and grace. Nice. Mm. All right. right. I like that. Another uplifting story. And this is my segment, Honoring Heroes. What a wonderful story about new chapters in your life. And in this story in particular, we honor a 93-year-old World War II veteran who was elected mayor in Tinton Falls, New Jersey, and was sworn in last night. Aww. So he campaigned. Vito Perillo is his name. And he didn't let his age stop him from running and winning the job of mayor. In fact, he wore two pairs of shoes going door-to-door -door campaigning. Last night, he was officially sworn in. Please watch. Faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly performed, and justly performed all the duties, all the duties of office of the mayor, of office of the mayor, according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So how many gosh? Congratulations. Mayor. That. So he's a former electronics engineer for the U.S. Department of Defense, a U.S. Navy veteran, and was the borough police chief from 2004 to 2011. And by the way, the Bible that he was used uh, to be sworn in on belonged to his late wife of 64 oh. years, May, and she died um, sadly in 2013. So very exciting. Nice. Good name for a mayor. Vito. Yeah. My mom yes. was a war bride. She's 98 years old. We just visited her in Sarasota, Florida. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my mom, uh, Jewish, my dad, uh, Catholic, Puerto Rican Catholic. So we always were conflicted between Christmas and Hanukkah. So if you notice these shirts, we resolved the dilemma, oi to the world. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. She looks so good. Doesn't she look fabulous? She, she looks really good. My sister Sharon right? there. Family. God yeah, bless. She is. So it's, nice. It's, it's soul America. in the foreground there. Yeah. Oh, so you just it. wanted to oh, show your oh, 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 snuck oh, that one How'd that get in there? He's done it again. Every chance you get. Episode of the five.